Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Carnegis, and joining me today is Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Great to be here with you today to introduce this episode with a longtime friend and colleague and music business legend, Jeff Skunk Baxter. Yeah, I remember when I first came to IHMC and I was skimming through the bios of my new research colleagues. I'm a huge fan of classic rock, and I had heard Skunk's name in the context of Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers and a lot of other affiliations, but I had no idea that he's now involved as a defense technology advisor. Yes, Skunk is uh, a remarkable guy, a valued colleague, and a first-rate thinker. Yeah, you have to love his job title at IHMC, Senior Thinker and Raconteur. Yeah, Raconteur. That's sort of a double play on words. Very, very good. (laughs) Um, It was really interesting to hear about his transition from music to technology. I have a number of professional musician friends, and we often talk about the similarities between groundbreaking artists and cutting-edge scientists. So it was really cool to hear Skunk describe this so eloquently with his jazz quartet analogy. It was a really fun interview, and I'm so glad that you could join us. Oh, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. (laughs) Um, Before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews that are piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continuously and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews with an eye toward selecting the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, Just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Our winning review today was posted by someone who goes by the wonderful nickname, John the Nuke, entitled, Incredible Topics, Great Questions, Just the Right Depth. So here's his review. IHMC is a true gem that keeps shining. Now we get to see, hear, it on a regular basis. I've often wanted to participate in their wonderful enrichment programs provided for their staff and locals in Florida, but distance has prevented it. No longer. The inquisitive public now has access to this wonderful podcast. Ken's voice is made for radio. He really does talk that way. And all the host questions are exactly what I would ask for. Keep up the great work, guys. Thanks, John the Nuke, and I agree about Ken's voice, and I can second the comment that he really does talk that way all the time. And thank you to all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. Okay, now on to today's interview with Jeff Skunk Baxter. Jeff Baxter has had a long and successful career in the music and entertainment field as a founding member of the group Steely Dan, a member of the Doobie Brothers, and as a record producer for such artists as Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys and the Stray Cats. He has been a studio musician for 35 years, recording with such artists as Donna Summer, Dolly Parton, Ringo Starr, and Rod Stewart, and has composed music for movies and television. Although still actively involved as a guitarist, composer, producer, and engineer, Mr. Baxter currently serves as an advisor and consultant with multiple agencies and defense technology companies. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, this is Don Carnegis, and I'm here with today's guest, Jeff Baxter. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And I'm also here with IHMC director, Ken Ford. Ken, great to have you with us. Likewise. Great to be here and great to be chatting with uh, Jeff Skunk Baxter. (laughs) So, Jeff, when I was first looking at the IHMC website, this is about a year and a half ago, and Ken was recruiting me to come to IHMC, I was looking at some of the bios, and I noticed one of the more interesting bios was yours. (laughs) And I also thought that you had one of the most interesting uh, job titles titles when it comes to IHMC. So. Yeah, senior thinker and raconteur. And the raconteur thing can be taken in several ways. That's right. That's right. It's rockin', rackin', all, right. all of that. Wonderful French word. So, Jeff, let's just start at the beginning. Talk a little bit about your influences growing up. Wow, that's interesting. It's a I mean, general question, huh? <laughs> influences growing up. Uh, Wes Montgomery, Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, uh, Beethoven, Chopin, uh, Bach, uh, you know, Segovia. So musically, those people shaped my life, classical music, and then, of course, rock and roll, Chuck Berry, The Ventures, and all those bands. 
Uh, my dad was a big influence. Uh, uh, I was five years old, and my mother gave me a great gift. She taught me to read when I was about five. And so uh, my dad came in one time when I was reading Huckleberry Finn with my mom, and, uh, you know, I'm some little snotty little five-year-old, and he says, so you can read now, huh? I go, yeah, I can read. So he went in the library, and he dropped a copy of Winston Churchill's Gathering Storm in my lap, and he said, read that. <laughs> so it took me about a year and a half to get through it. So uh, when I finished it, I realized that Winston Churchill was probably one of the greatest human beings to ever walk the planet because not only was he a, a brilliant on some levels, but he was human, foible, plus anybody that's got the stones to meet the president of the United States naked in a bathtub with a bottle of brandy <laughs> smoking a cigar. That cat's a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would you say he was probably one of the influences that helped shape your direction to going into working in the defense industry? Uh, yeah, my and my, my dad was f uh, five years active and twenty years reserve, and and uh, uh, somewhat of a, actually more than somewhat of a historian. So there were a uh, tremendous amount of uh, books and literature that was available to me growing up that uh, were focused on history, especially military history. And once I learned to read, um, I tried to read as much of that as I could. And between my dad and uh, many of the um, books and uh, autobiographies of some of the famous people that uh, he allowed me to access. It certainly had an influence on me. So what led to your interest in music? So you talked about kind of your musical influences directly and then your parents having this influence on you when it comes to some of the work that you're even doing now and your interest in history and, and some of the work that you're doing. Um, but what was your actual, what, what led you to that interest in music? Was there a family tr tradition when it comes to music or? Well, my mom played piano and I asked her again when I was five years old if I could take piano lessons. <clears throat> and she said, sure. And she got me a teacher. And then... Uh, uh, that by that time we'd moved to Mexico City, and, and uh, uh, I wanted a. My parents got me a guitar for my ninth birthday, and I wanted a bicycle. I was really pissed off, so I put the <laughs> guitar on the wall and it hang there for about a year until a buddy of mine said, "I'm taking some guitar lessons. If I teach you some chords, will you, you know, play along with me?" And when I actually started to play the guitar, I went, "This is it. <laughs> this works for me." So that kind of started it. Just felt natural. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so in previous uh, talks, you mentioned that the Eastern Prep School that you attended taught you how to learn. So what taught you to become a musician? So you talked about your mother's influence and then taking these lessons. Is there, were there any other great influences when it came to you learning how to become a musician? Yeah, listening again to the greats. My, <laughs> excuse me, my dad was very good friends with a gentleman named Al Ross, who was a desk jockey in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., where I was born and when I spent my early youth, uh, who was a very big jazz fan and uh, made sure that my dad had an incredible library. That's why I say I was listening to Ella Fitzgerald and Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, I mean, mm -hmm. Thelonious Monk, uh, and Louis Armstrong. He was a big Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, uh, King Oliver fan. And uh, I remember in Mexico, actually, when I was 11 years old, when the Jazz All-Stars came to Mexico City, it was uh, Ella Fitzgerald, again, Charlie Parker, Wes Montgomery. Mm -hmm. it, it, to, to be able to listen to those people, that really hit me hard. I said, this, this is what I want to do. I mean, I love rock and roll, and I like surf music and all that kind of stuff, but the complexity of, uh, of jazz uh, and the improvisational uh, underpinning of it I think was, was really excited me because later on in life, as I began to realize that improvisation in a jazz um, structure is really an analytical process. And it's almost the same as an intelligence analysis um, uh, group where each person steps out, has a chance to uh, offer a, an analysis based on a theme and then come up with a new product. So the two things, at least in my wacky little mind, kind of made perfect sense to me. And then learning later on about the difference between left brain and right brain thinking, I think most musicians and artists are kind of pre-wired. It just takes a little stimulus to get them going. But being able to look at 
problem solving from a kind of a nonlinear, multifaceted, multi-layered point of view, I think gave me whatever advantage I do. Again, I'm amazed that people care what I have to say, but I'm <laughs> flattered and I appreciate it. And I think maybe some of that or much of that comes from that problem solving template that I've been able to develop through music. You've been a significant participant in the history of rock music, from Jimmy James and the Blue Flames <laughs> to Ultimate Spinach and Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers. Let's talk a little bit about the early days of Steely Dan, a favorite band for many of our listeners, of which you were a founding member in 1972. As I recall, you were with the band for the first three albums, Can't Buy a Thrill in 1972, Countdown to Ecstasy in 1973, and Pretzel Logic in 1974. Can you talk a little bit about those exciting days and the dynamics uh, in the band? Bands always have fascinating and unique interpersonal dynamics. Yes, yeah, like marriage. What, what breaks up marriages? Sex, money, and drugs. Uh, same thing with bands, although Steely Dan, because we were all studio musicians, we were, we were a little less raucous and out of, a little less off the, off the, off the ball than most folks, because, um, no matter how famous you were, when you show up in the studio to do a recording session, the producer doesn't care who you are. You show up on time, nine o'clock, downbeat, play it right the first time, or you're fired because there's two thousand other people waiting for that spot. So uh, there was a lot of interdisciplinary um, thought put into the music. Maybe it sometimes might have been a little too much. We used to joke that it took us three weeks at four hundred dollars an hour just to find a comfortable chair, but. Uh, you know, that was the way it was. They did my Sharona, the whole record for $11,000 and sold a gazillion copies. So everybody has their own way of approaching the problem. But Steely Dan was, a, we, we, we didn't know either. I mean, we were, we were just taking our best shot. Uh, we tried to get a record deal. Nobody would sign it. I mean, if, and, and by the way, I just want people to know that, I don't know if you know about Ken's early history. But Ken was very involved in the rock and roll business as a as a uh, agent and, and and managing bands and 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 booking bands. Actually, he uh, he um, was uh, doing it around the same time as I was playing in Boston with uh, with uh, Tim Buckley and the Holy Motor Rounders and Ultimate Spinach. So he actually can speak with some authority on this. <laughs> Only a little. <laughs> no, but hey, more than most people. Uh, so, I mean, just imagine if you walked into a record company with a demo, Dr. Udu's Proto Man, nobody's going to sign this band. So we, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan had gotten a publishing deal at ABC Records. So we didn't have any place to rehearse. So we set up in the president of the record company's office. We'd wait till he let, went home and then we would set up and rehearse in the office. Well, one day... We just kind of fell asleep in the office, and he walks in and says, what the hell is all this crap? And so we said, well, we're this band. And we weren't sure it was going to be Steely Dan or Big Nardo in the eighth grade. <laughs> but we, Steely Dan was shorter, so we figured it fit better on a record. So uh, he said, well, I mean, and, and this is Jay Lasker, who, who is the epitome of the record guy. Got a nine-foot cigar leaning back. He goes, all right, you guys, play me something. Show me what you got. And so we played a few tunes for him, and uh, he signed the band. <laughs> and that's kind of how it got started, you know. <laughs> As you implied uh, earlier in these comments, Steely Dan, and especially Becker and Fagan, you know, they were known to have been very focused on getting it right in the studio. You talked about the chair. <laughs> the, uh, you know, they were, they were kind of known for this in the business, and pundits uh, use words like perfectionism and obsession when discussing the band in the studio. And you can hear it in the recordings. Uh, one uh, hears tales of sessions in which musicians would do many, many, many takes. Was this effort toward perfectionism the case right from the start of Steely Dan, or did this sort of evolve over time as the band matured and aged? Well, I think, again, from, from the uh, naissance of the band, I mean, certainly um, I was out doing sessions all the time as well because we hadn't really been that successful, so I had to make a living. 
Um, and my approach was exactly that, of getting it right, because that's what was demanded of you as a studio musician. So for me, it wasn't really alien to take however much time it took. I mean, sometimes it would get a little nuts, and there is a fine line between perfection and obsession. Um, but I would say for the, for the most part, uh, the music speaks for itself. You can hear it in the recordings, the care that was taken. Now, also, I need to give credit to a very special person because although uh, Becker and Fagan, I think, were exceptional songwriters, and the, the other people in the band, Denny, myself, uh, uh, Jimmy Hodder, which is one of the greatest drummers that ever lived, uh, the way the, the signature of that of the of Steely Dan Records was uh, Roger Nichols, the engineer. The engineer, I've heard uh, this. His incredible talent as an engineer, and and when I say engineer, just not a person who understands the mechanics of recording, but someone who has a, a an ability to inject his art into it as well. I think uh, is one of the unsung, mm. really people who made Steely Dan as, uh, as a, a, I guess the word would be as recognized and respected as it was and still is because the recordings were just immaculate and were, meticulous yes. and incredible sounding. Uh, it would always amaze me when I would go play a gig with another band or go do something and the, the sound guys, uh, the front of house folks were using a Steely Dan CD to, uh, to voice their their room, and I'm not saying that because I mean of you know anything that I uh, you know making it personal, um, um, but it was Roger. Mm. It was all about Roger making that perfect. To this day, when uh, hi-fi stores are demoing uber high-end, high fidelity equipment, you never hear them play music from that era because it typically doesn't stand up in terms of the audio quality. And the Steely Dan stuff is just, as you said, immaculate. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about the transition from Steely Dan to the Doobie Brothers. Well, it's one of those things that, uh, um, since all I had was a cat named Damien, <laughs> uh, which I got a condo for him down there in, uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles and hired a lady to take care of him because I wanted to be on the road all the time. I wanted to be in as many bands as I could. Um, so Steely Dan was opening the show, uh, for the Doobie Brothers, uh, f uh, uh, for a number of tours and it just sort of morphed. Um, a couple of the folks in the Doobie Brothers said, well, Hey, would you like to sit in for a couple of tunes with, with the Doobies? I said, sure. You know, especially cause I was playing pedal steel and, and they had, um, a couple of tunes that were certainly country or country or or country rock oriented uh and then it was three songs and then it was five songs and then it was half the show and then it started to get to the point where i would go out on tour with both bands at different times and finally um there was a, a time when i was out with the doobie brothers in england uh at a festival and i think uh Becker and Fagan had decided that they they wanted to sort of take a hiatus on touring. And I had talked to them on the phone and hung up the phone and said, well, that's kind of it for me playing with Steely Dan for a while. And they said, well, now you're in the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> so I thought, okay, all right, that works for me. Because I I, I like the Doobies. I love the band. I, I was constantly amazed at the depth of musicianship in the band that hadn't been really... Uh, had a chance to flower. And by the end of the time, by the time I left, I suppose, uh, for me, uh, leaving at the time when we did the minute by minute record, that kind of, to me, was the, was the apex of what that band and the musicians in that band could really do, especially when I brought Mike McDonald into the band mm. and it gave it a slightly different flavor. But again, the, the musicians in that band just stood right up. As a matter of fact, I was, I said, okay, 
we're going to go in the studio now with other bands. We're going to record as a studio band for Carly Simon and Leo Sayer and a bunch of different other, and you're going to be sitting in that chair at 9 a.m. Nobody cares who you are. When you hear the count off and you hear the click, we go. And it was amazing how everybody in that band stepped up. Uh, I remember Keith Knudsen uh, passed away many years ago, an incredible drummer. I mean, before, it, the band was excellent anyway. It had a wonderful, freewheeling, uh, rock and roll, musical, um, uh, uh, feel-good flavor to it. Uh, a little loose sometimes, but that's not important too because music sometimes has to be that way and there's nothing wrong with it. And then I remember we were doing a Leo Sayer record and Keith came back into the control room and he said, you know... I dropped the snare drum beat bar 63. I thought, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Because everybody is growing and everybody is, you know, um, fulfilling their, their abilities. So I think in a lot of ways, the musicianship of the band for a long time was underestimated. Mm -hmm. And when we did the Living on the Fault Line album, you listen to that record and you go, is that the Doobie Brothers? Yeah, the evolution of the band was remarkable after... Uh, you know, with with your input in a jazzier style, and and of course, McDonald was a great addition. Yeah, good R and B. Yeah, I was just going to ask you <laughs> about how, uh, your role in uh, bringing him to the band. I mean, I, I was told by someone that you played a key role in that. Well, yeah, I guess if, and that might be the definition of a key role. Uh, Mike <clears throat> was playing in a bar in Huntington Beach. Uh, and we, when I was still in Steely Dan, and we had heard him play and sing, and we went, we got to have this guy in our band uh, at, to go on the road and travel because his voice was incredible and his piano playing was really good, and it, it, uh, it, it fit very well. So there was a situation uh, where uh, when I was in the Doobies, um, uh, Tom Johnson was having some serious health problems. And uh, just one night, uh, couldn't make it on stage. I mean, it happens to all of us at one time or another. And it really was um, the, the idea that, okay, what are we going to do? And so every once in a while, you got you to gotta make a command decision. So I walked out on stage and I said, we were at the New Orleans Superdome, 50-some thousand people. And said, here's the deal, folks. We can, you can all have your money back. Or if you wait 10 days, we'll come back and put on a show for you. Nobody cashed in their tickets. I called Michael. I said, there's a one-way ticket to New Orleans. Get your butt out here. We're going to rehearse for like 12, 14 hours a day. And we did it. And the band got five encores. So obviously... You got to take a shot, right? Yeah, it's a good story. I'm glad we asked. And again, everybody, that's a tribute to everybody in the band who could just, who uh, really stood up and, and gave it 110%. That's always key. So tell us about your transition from being a full time rock musician working at the top level to a role advising in missile defense and other important topics. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as I have been quoted a couple of times, <clears throat> a radar is just an electric guitar on steroids, you know, there's really not that much <laughs> difference. But um, I guess it really started uh, way back when I was still living in California and we'd had some terrible rains, big floods in the canyon that I was living in. There was a gentleman, uh, elderly gentleman down at the bottom of the hill whose house was full of mud and I helped shovel it out. And uh, afterwards, he invited me into his office f uh, for uh, for a beer, and and on the walls were pictures of Sidewinder missiles and and aircraft. And I and I said, "Gee, what you know? What do you do?" He said, "Well, I'm a you know an aerospace engineer. I helped design the Sidewinder, and I helped design some other things." Bob went, and that my action, my company is named Went Aircraft because that it kind of in honor of him, and as a as a gift. He gave me a subscription to Aviation Week, and I just fell into it, uh, especially because at that time, I was doing uh, a lot of work for a company called Roland. Uh, I've still been with them for like 40 years. They, they make uh, incredibly fa uh, 
quali- high quality musical instruments, keyboards, guitar synthesizers. I was working on a guitar synthesizer design at the time. Um, and as I was reading through Aviation Week, which then, or Aviation Leak, right? As, as it, you start reading that, then you start, I started reading other publications and delving into it, especially to help me understand the new world of digital uh, electronics, which was at the forefront of the military, but really was just making a uh, sort of debut in the, in the civilian world and learning more and more and taking knowledge from that and applying it to, I was working for Roland, I was working for Akai, I was working for Fender, I was working for different, some different companies. Um, and I mean, I've told this story before, but just one day, I, I don't know, I wrote this paper on converting the Aegis system to do theater missile defense on a mobile platform and why it might make a difference to NATO. My dad always said, if you got an idea, just write it down. So I gave it to uh, Congressman Dana Rohrbacher, who I've been doing some work with on the law enforcement side. Um, And he gave it to uh, Vice Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Kurt Weldon, who called Dana back and said, what is this guy from Raytheon or Boeing? He says, no, he's a guitar player for the Doobie Brothers. And I got a call from Kurt Weldon and said, would you be willing to accept a position on the Armed Services Committee as a consultant on missile defense? I said, I think so. (laughs) And uh, yeah, when I got to Washington, very interesting. A whole new world for me. I bet. But it was, I, I began to realize what my dad had been trying to instill in me. Not that he wasn't happy with my career in music, but... When I got to work with some incredible people, General Mal O'Neill, General Lester Lyles, Ron Kadish, uh, just unbelievably talented, smart, patriotic men and women, uh, that tripped something in me. I think my dad had prepared me for that all along. And, and Ken, you mentioned, you mentioned prep school and boarding school. That's Those are the... That's the template that you learn to apply when you get into a situation like that. And so my dad made sure I was well prepared for that. And it's been a, a great run ever since. And I see, the, I see the connection all the time. My first course in radar uh, at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency was uh, Tom Agar. Um, Tom's retired now, but Tom was teaching a great course in, in, uh, in radar, which he calls the perfect sensor. And the course starts off with Beethoven, Bach, hmm. Jimi Hendrix, um, uh, and a, a, a number of you know incredible Pink Floyd, uh, incredible bands, because he was trying to help people understand that waveforms, frequency, and the way that the uh, electron and the way that physics behaves uh, gives music and um, theoretical physics, a, a common, a common bond. Absolutely. And at Lawrence Livermore, the same thing. I was working with one of the coolest guys I ever met, uh, Charlie Towns, who got the Nobel prize for inventing the laser. And when Charlie started talking about, uh, you know, coherent phase, uh, waveforms and, and, uh, uh, coherent oscillations, and I said, Charlie, that's what music is. He says, you got it. Mm-hmm. Secret to the universe. Mm-hmm. So I think I found a spot there that kind of everything just sort of made perfect sense. Even uh, Edward Teller at that particular meeting, his eyes widened because Edward Teller was a concert pianist. He loved Mozart. Hmm. And uh, I just more and more people that I met were either musician, physicists, physicists, musicians. I mean, didn't uh, uh, Brian May from Queen mm-hmm. yep. just uh, get a, uh, it was a PhD or yes, a master? He, he PhD has a PhD. Yeah. In, uh, in uh, astrophysics. So the connect is there. And I guess it just took a little while for me to get to the point where I could take advantage of it. And of course, crazy guys like Ken give me an opportunity <laughs> to actually practice what I preach a little bit, give me a little slack and, uh, and give me an opportunity to participate with some of the most amazing thinking folks, minds, talented people in the planet. So I'm a lucky guy. Yeah. I'm the luckiest guy there is. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so I'm kind of curious, when you started, you talked about your transition to working in D.C., uh, what was it like and how well were you received by the defense industry <laughs> coming in as a, a rock rock star, essentially? Well, it's a, it was it's certainly a, uh, 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 a double-sided sword. Uh, the good news was that the bands that I was in and the music that I played in, because we had a, a tremendous amount of notoriety and success, uh, I, it brought a familiarity. So when I would sit with generals and admirals and folks, they already knew kind of who I was, which is a good way to start. But the next question you're going to ask is, okay, so uh, the, as you know, you can talk the talk, but you really have to walk the walk. You have to get to the point where you can be uh, uh, a contributing factor. And it's, uh, it's like a really beautiful girl in a physics laboratory. People aren't paying attention to her knowledge. They're paying attention to her looks. So she has to be 115% better uh, uh, and, and more on top of it than anybody else. And I, I felt that I had to do the same thing. And luckily, I started reading about a, ge a gentleman named Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd, who was that kind of person in the U.S. Air Force, uh, and felt like, even though I never met the man, that I had an opportunity to learn from, from him about how to do that. And then I remember um, I had given a conference on uh, a press conference at the National Press Club on missile defense, and uh, it was a it was an ugly day because the press at the time just didn't seem to think that missile defense was a worthy endeavor, hmm. and so it was pretty bloody. And so I'm after about an hour of this, I sat down, and uh, there were two people in the room, uh, uh, and one of them was. Uh, Gary Soika. Gary Soika had been the the uh, chief of staff of the Senate Committee on Intelligence, and he came up to me and said, "Well, that was pretty. That was pretty, pretty brutal." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, it sure was." It's my first conference press conference in Washington D.C. And what the hell's going on? And he said, "Well, I would like to invite you to be a senior fellow and a member of the Board of Regents at the Potomac Institute." And I went, "My God! I mean, I knew about Potomac Institute." And, and what they did, and you know, I said, "Why me?" And he said, "Well, see all those people out there." I said, "Yeah." He says, "They hate you." I said, uh, "Is that good?" He said, "Oh yeah, oh yeah." Because <laughs> if they don't hate you in this town, you're not, and they really hate you. So welcome aboard. So you're doing something right. <laughs> and and I, you know, I just had to kind of, you know, I, I put two and two together to come up with five, which eventually, you know. In Washington, you can make anything add up. <laughs> well, it's important to be disliked by the right people. <laughs> That's what he told me, and and I I wasn't used to that. I mean, people yeah. are supposed to like your music, and, right? You know, <laughs> not in Washington. But um, uh, the, the, again, the people in Washington that I've had a chance to work with, both in the in the government, in industry, and in the military, and in the intelligence community, are unbelievably talented and very patriotic people who. Uh, I think, for the most part, are really unsung in what they do. Mm -hmm. And it's an honor to be able to participate with them in any fashion whatsoever. So it, it kind of worked out. And we did a gig the other day at the British Embassy. The uh, One of the guitar players was the former deputy director of DOE. One of the other guitar players, the deputy secretary of state. Mm. Uh, the bass players, former uh, secretary of, undersecretary of state for military affairs. You know, that's your usual crew. <laughs> and so more and more and more, I see the connection between the creativity of music, the problem solving and nonlinear uh, uh, intellectual approach uh, to problem solving and the connection to very, very talented people in government. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. 
So, Jeff, in a previous IHMC lecture, you discussed the importance of uh, improvisation for problem solving, working with intelligent people who can think outside of the box. And you, you drew this great analogy of a symphony orchestra versus a jazz quartet. Can you expand on this analogy? Well, sure. Uh, um, the, the symphony orchestra is a very organized, um, highly, highly regulated uh, entity uh, staffed with extremely talented players, musicians, all of whom uh, have been chosen for their uh, expertise and their ability to, uh, to when we use the word play, to uh, perform. Uh, and performing is not just playing the music, but playing it with emotion and feeling. Mm-hmm. However, I mean, if you look at an org chart, for a symphony orchestra, it looks uh, frighteningly like a government orchard <laughs> with, you know, there's the guys over here, the first violins, second violins, and, uh, and the brass over here, and it all kind of looks in, and I don't know, it's probably like real life, you know, uh, second violin is sleeping with the first violin and his wife. <laughs> how, how do you know a ch- when a cello player is driving down the street? Because he's got a Domino's Pizza sign on his car. That's the yeah. joke in L.A. Because there's no work, you know, for, <laughs> for cello players. So these people who are extremely talented and extremely um, gifted uh, are then organized into a pretty um, rigid group. And the only person in the symphony orchestra that really has the opportunity to inject um, anything other than the performing it the way the music was um, supposedly written by the composer, is the conductor. You know, and again, the sort of leader of the leader of the pack. Uh, he's the one that can decide whether a piece of music should be a little more legato. He can um, uh, dictate the dynamics. He can dictate tempos. Uh, he can dictate um, subtle pieces of the of the of the performance that give a slightly different performance. But by and large, you're reading off a sheet of paper. There's really no no straying from what's written. The jazz quintet is just the opposite. Instead of a pyram- pyramidal um, uh, structure, it is horizontal. It is a group of people, all of whom are experts as well in their fields, but instead of uh, sticking to the written melody, they play their melody, or the, this is a generalization, but this is kind of what jazz is about. Uh, there's a theme, a melody, uh, and then everybody performs that melody as a group. And then each person takes turns stepping out and improvising over the theme in his own way, interpreting it with all the freedom that they can he or she can muster. And then once that person is finished, the next person steps up. And then the next person and the next person until the, the quintet, the quartet, the trio, uh, whatever it may be, has each of them has created a, an analytical product. And at the end of it, you have a brand new version of the piece of music that you originally started with because it has all the brand new input from each of those musicians uh, on a horizontal level. That to me, it was, this is the secret of, of analysis. Then one day I was uh, waiting to, to go into general Clapper's office and I was reading an article in a, on a magazine that's uh, uh, put out by the uh, the intelligence community uh, that uh, 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 William Nolte had written uh, uh, Bill was a member of the IC and now teaches at the University of Maryland, teaches intelligence, and he talked about revolutionizing analysis in the intelligence community. And he had a paragraph where he said, what we really need to do is we need to teach our analysts to improvise in the same way musicians do. Well, that went right to the center of my brain, and immediately I asked Jim Clapper, please, I... I you got to get me on the phone with this guy. I got to talk to him. So we ended up spending time together, having lunch, and then I began to recall the writings of General of, of uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd, who spoke of uh, his um, 
his endeavors to codify on some level analysis. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of the OODA loop. That was uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd's idea, observe, orient, decide, and act. Um, some say observe, destroy, uh, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, there are a lot of variants. Yeah, my race is right. Uh, but his, his, his philosophy was one of creation and destruction, analysis, which is breaking the problem down, and synthesis, which is putting together the pieces of the problem and coming up with a completely different idea. And I said, that's what musicians do. Mm-hmm. And I do a lot of corporate speaking, and I, when I play the guitar, I, 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 I do, for instance, the example of, of uh, Pachelbel's Canon. Now, you've heard Pachelbel's Canon a bazillion times because every wedding that you've been to has a nice lady in a white flowing dress either playing it on the harp or the guitar. And it's a nice piece of music. But it's interesting that the same chord pattern, the same chord progression is the same chord progression for Let It Be Me by the Everly Brothers or When a, uh, when a Man Loves a Woman by Percy Sledge. Somebody in the Brill Building, which was the songwriting capital of the world, uh, on on uh, in New York City on Seventh Avenue, s- heard those chords and said, "I want to break this down into its component parts and reassemble it in another way," and you know, sold millions of records. So the examples are there. It's really it's you can't argue with it. Yeah. And so as I got further and further into it, I began to see how the music, especially the improvisational part. And the idea of analysis came came together, and knock on wood, I hope that that's given me at least some insight to be helpful uh, in terms of the work that I do for my country. Absolutely. In, in fact, this very uh, week, IHMC is hosting a Blue Sky Innovation Meeting for the Air Force Research Laboratory in which uh, you will play an important role. Uh, it's... Uh, It'll be a nice opportunity for each of us to practice life outside of the box. And a good group of Blue Sky participants behaves in a similar way to an ensemble of jazz musicians, as you described. That's very true. And a terrible Blue Sky participant uh, acts like he or she thinks they're the conductor. (laughs) Well, you've, you've managed to create this architecture that people can plug into. And I've watched over the years as I participated in these uh, Blue Sky um, endeavors with you where there is n- not, a, not, not a rancorous uh, 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 attitude towards the people that are participate, but the ones who do not have the improvisational uh, uh, you know, mindset and the ability to improvise, as they say, play with others, uh, have gone their own way. Yeah, that's right. They're usually one-time participants. If that. Yeah. I spent a lot of time <laughs> at AFRL. I, I <laughs> love that place, so yeah. I'm really looking forward there to it. There were a couple of people, only a couple, who, who, <laughs> who didn't make it to the end of one time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an honor. It's an honor yeah. to be here. It's well, an honor to work and, again, to, to be able to participate with some of the greatest thinking uh, thinkers, as you say, senior thinkers. Yeah. Somebody asked me if I was senior thinker. <laughs> so that was kind of cool because I grew up in Mexico. Yeah, it could but, be. Yeah, it could be. That's his new title. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. Another one. <laughs> so, Jeff, you also mentioned previous work in war games, where thinking outside of the box is critical for anticipating potential directions for terrorist attacks. Can you tell us more about these war games and what they entail and how improvisation can play a role in anticipating what might happen next? Well, the, the war games that I participate, I mean, people always ask me, well, what do you do? You go out and blow stuff up? And goes, <laughs> no, no. It's basically a tabletop exercise where there is a blue team, which usually represents the good guys, uh, the red team, which represents the bad guys, although I know that those are terms that are somewhat fluid in their definition. A white team, which oversees the game, and then there are various other possible teams, like a green team that might re- represent um, uh, sub-participants that are not necessarily um, uh, connected to or 
are uh, uh, directly involved with the the adversary and the blue team. Uh, and the tabletop exercises go where the there will be a, a theme, uh, a particular AOR, an area of, of, of responsibility, a theater of war, where the blue and red teams will be pretty well defined. And then the red team representing in its best way the doctrine, philosophy, theology, if you will, uh, governance of uh, the adversary, uh, fights and plans and acts in a way that would hopefully best represent that adversary, and blue reacts to it. And because there's expertise on both sides, I found that wargaming is an extremely uh, uh, worthy endeavor. As a matter of fact, our present Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Wark, had made a statement about this a couple of years ago, how he felt about wargaming. And I actually invited him to the Schriever Games, and he showed up. It goes to show you that uh, uh, even though you, some people think there are folks up on the lofty halls of Mahogany Row up there, there are people that are willing to get down and roll up their sleeves and get into it. Um, so, but in a lot of ways, those games were based on known doctrines. But to answer your question on terrorism, the improvisational part is important because terrorists don't have the weapons. They don't have the capabilities or the resources. So they have to improvise. They have to do things that are very outside of the normal architecture of military thinking. And for that, good improvisation uh, we found in some of the improvisational terrorist games that we've done, we've seen things happen. I mean, we we posited many years ago, even before Tom Clancy wrote about it in his book about using airplanes as cruise missiles, if somebody was just dedicated enough, because we had seen the history of World War II in the Pacific um, with the Japanese and how that was a that took everybody by surprise. So uh, I uh, I. I applaud and and um, underpin and support the whole concept of improvisation in wargaming. So, Jeff, the transition from analog to digital recording in the music industry back in the 1980s involved significant changes in hardware and addition of, of new software. How does this parallel with defense technology evolution? Well, certainly uh, the the digital revolution, in other words, the ability to reproduce music using solid state electronics. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. The transition from vacuum tubes and hard wiring, uh, capacitors, resistors, other electronic components that were added in a kind of a kit manner to uh, shuffled around in different ways to to take more and more advantage of the of the reproductive capabilities of, of vacuum tubes morphed into what we call the digital world where there are no vacuum tubes. There are no real uh, hard wiring, the, you know, very expensive guitar amplifiers in their advertising, point to point wiring. Some guy with a soldering iron has wired a point from this point to this point and that is accepted as much like uh, the difference between a brand new car today and a uh, Shelby Cobra 428 V8 big block engine. <laughs> That's kind of the difference. Uh, certainly both are admirable, but each one has its, its weaknesses and its, its advantages. The, the government or the U.S. government had the money, the time, and the desire to invest in solid state electronics. And from that came, obviously, the bleed out into the civilian world in, in, in much the same as, as, what is the old joke? You're too young to remember, but Tang was this orange juice drink that uh, became famous drank, because right? it was on the space shuttle. What? <laughs> That's what astronauts drank, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, there you go. But um, And all of this, uh, the first satellites, you know, certainly uh, Sputnik Explorer, um, rockets to the moon, all of this technology that grew out of the uh, resources that were uh, spent um, by the military and uh, trickled down to the civilian world. So the, the digital revolution was certainly a part of that. 
So when you gave your public lecture at IHMC in 2009, you asked, what can we do to improve intelligence? In your view, how far have we come in improving it? I think we've come a long way. Uh, And obviously, I have to be somewhat circumspect at what I say, but uh, in the same way as there was a kind of accepted methodology for the gathering, uh, collecting, processing, analysis, and dissemination of information that was prescient to a country's uh, needs to, for survival and, and, and war fighting. Um, some of that has changed. The, technical, the technological revolution of the cell phone the ability to communicate from anywhere without having to drop a dime in the slot someplace or call from your home, the ability to communicate and and see what millions of people are thinking at the same time, Uh, crowdsourcing, the uh, ability to read a tweet, the um, idea that young people, and I say young people because I'm 68 years old, um, who are incredibly comfortable with technologies. I mean, I, I hate to say this, but I think that many of my generation only learn about technology when their kid walks into the house with it and shows them what's going on. Um, that and the, the revolution in, in technology and information has forced a new way, a new paradigm of thinking in the intelligence community. And so there are some people, again, who... Uh, for them, it's just not their cup of tea. And then there are some folks that reach out and embrace it. And I've, I've got to tell you, uh, and this is just not, this is a no, uh, of course, Ken will know what this means, a no soap radio <laughs> view of, of the intelligence community. I'm amazed at how quickly the intelligence community has caught on to this, to this revolution and how they've not only understood it, but leveraged it. So I would say for the, for the very most part, uh, the intelligence community has, has uh, stood up and embraced pretty much everything. That's a nice improvement. I remember you once uh, compared the title of the Steely Dan album, Pretzel Logic, <laughs> to uh, some aspects of the intelligence community. Well, because when you only have limited tools, you're limited in the conclusions that you can draw. And sometimes the, the pretzel logic template comes to you, you're chasing your tail and you're coming back around to where you already were before because you don't have um, alternatives and um, um, uh, capabilities that apply to what you do. Now, I mean, it's almost infinite. Uh, really, now that we have tamed the electron, the electron is now the, the, the horse of the 21st century. So, Jeff, you said the U.S. beat the Soviet Union partly because of our soft power, meaning our cultural and economic power, among other elements. Can we still play that card in parts of the world that are largely attuned to reject U.S. culture? Yes. Uh, I remember playing in the Soviet Union, uh, playing in a country where every song that we had and every Lyric was illegal, yet 40,000 people in that soccer stadium knew every song. So there's there's a power uh, in the fact that people want to participate in music is a great, I guess, uh, for all you physicists out there, it's a great gluon. It's a way to bring uh, entities together that might not necessarily um, be comfortable uh, under the laws of physics. Um, yeah, the, the the soft power piece was huge. Uh, I remember reading that article by Joseph Nye in Foreign Policy about soft power, and it hit hit me right between the eyes. I actually called up Joe and you know, wrote wrote a couple of blurbs for his books and stuff. He he really figured it out. Uh, and there's two parts of it. One is uh, jazz, for instance, was illegal in the Soviet Union by virtue of the fact that improvisation is an expression of freedom. And in a country where nobody, where the government does not want you to exercise freedom, anything that would promote that 
or underpin that is deemed uh, illegal, bad. Um, typewriters were, you had to register a typewriter. Um, I brought some recording gear into the Soviet Union. I guess I can talk about that now. Uh, and that recording gear had to be registered even more than the, than the typewriters. So there was a fear that freedom, rock and roll, there's, there's no doubt that the two elements that brought down the Soviet Union <clears throat> were missile defense because the Russians truly believed that the United States had the technological prowess, uh, commitment, and resources to create a system that would shoot down missiles. And the other part of it was blue jeans, French fries, and Elvis Presley. Because the cultural part of that, for people who were starved for culture. Now, you're, to go on to your next uh, part of your question was, at in this day and age, at this time in, in history of mankind, does, does the West, because I include the Brits, I include you know other folks, uh, Brits saved us, by the way, because... We invented rock and roll, and then we got into the Bobby phase. Bobby Vinton, Bobby V, Bobby Wright, and Bobby, 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 Bobby. And thank God the Beatles said, hey, do you remember Chuck Berry? Do you remember? <laughs> thank you. Do you, do you, do you remember uh, you know, Blind Lemon Jefferson? Do you remember Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters? Thank you for doing that because we were going down a bad road. The, the cultural influences in American movies, American literature, American uh, uh freedom of improvisation have supplied are now starting to come back. I mean, there are some really great Japanese rock bands. Uh, Tito Puente, who is probably one of the most famous uh, salsa Latino uh, Latin music artists, he won the, the salsa uh, Latin contest a couple of years in a row with an all Japanese band, Soulful Cats. You know, folks who, who delved into it and got it. So it's starting to come back. Uh, what we've, the seeds that we planted are starting to come back. Uh, great Swedish jazz musicians, incredible French jazz musicians. J uh, French kept jazz alive during the, during the, uh, the bad days of the Depression. Um, yeah, I think there is room for that. And then it comes back to how improvisational, creative, and and, and far-thinking and insightful can those people be uh, to um, ride this wave? Yeah, I, I, I think the United States has a tremendous influence. Yes, there are people that say, we don't want you. We don't want your bad movies and your comic books and your, we'll shut off the shores and listen to their rock and roll <laughs> while we do missile drills. Uh, but there's the the freedom of expression is irrepressible, and people are interpreting it in any way they they see fit. And uh, I think the United States will always be a part of that. We may have a Bobby period again, but we'll get out of it. It's important that uh, folks appreciate that your music career has continued and uh, to this day. And uh, this happened while you were fashioning your new role. Uh, in defense and intelligence worlds, but these are not in conflict. And in fact, unless I'm mistaken, you are uh, working on a solo album now. Can you tell us about that? And wh when should we expect that? Well, you're very kind to ask. Uh, I've been working on this solo project for over 15 years <laughs> because it's just commitments to both uh, the work that I do for the government and also commitments to, as a studio musician working on other people's records and producing records. It's just trying to find that time. Uh, a gentleman that I've been working with, uh, Jeffrey C.J. Vanson, incredible keyboard player, just nominated for a Grammy for producing Toto's new record. Uh, I decided many years ago, we met doing jingles in Chicago. Uh, actually, that's a really cool story. I'll tell you very quick. Uh, we used to get up in the morning. I used to sleep on the, on the couch in Universal Studio, which is a recording studio in, uh, in, in Chicago. Get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, start doing jingles, work until 11 or 12 at night. You know, we'd probably do 6, 7, 8, you know, Lay's Potato Chips, Budweiser, Beer Fort. And then I'd go back to sleep on the couch because I'd fly into Chicago for a week just to do nothing but jingles. And CJ was... Uh, for, uh, on the vast majority of those sessions as a keyboard player. And so one time was a Friday 
the, uh, the, the producer for this particular jingle, who will remain nameless, came in with just hair on fire. I mean, completely fried, been up for like days, completely out <laughs> of his mind, and put a piece of music in front of us. And all the, the only thing that was on the piece of music was a key signature, a time signature, and 64 bars. And that was it. And he said, so come on, guys. You ready? And uh, I looked at CJ. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's let's go. And what we realized is we could play music together without we could improvise actual uh, melodies and songs together. Which what we've done as part of this solo record is just free thinking, free free playing together. So yeah, about fifteen, almost twenty years now. Finally, it's done. Um, probably start touring in Japan in the beginning of the year. Uh, release the rec- the release the project because I don't know if it's going to be. It's not like the old days. We're going to make a record. Right. Uh, whatever the medium will be, and it will be a number of them, uh, release it and go out and do something that I've crafted on my own. It's something that was on my bucket list. Yeah, so it'll thank be. Thank you for asking. It'll be great. I'm really looking forward to it. And when you go on the road, I hope you uh, come here and perform right well, here. Well, absolutely. Uh, and I, a number of folks stepped up. It was going to be an instrumental record, and then I, I ran into Mike McDonald, and Mike said, "Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm in." This this would be a case where you can trust the promoter. Well, there you go, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and Clint Blacks wanted to do some stuff, and Johnny Lang. So yeah, we just It'll opened up the opened up the floodgates, and uh, um, I'm really looking forward to it. I I. Uh, something I've always wanted to do. Yeah, it's great. But thank you for asking. I really oh, appreciate it. It's wonderful. I, I, I was at a restaurant waiting for a table the other day, and uh, they had that uh, old uh, cartoon show about Texas on the show. I think it was called King of King of the Hill. King oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And somebody says, you know, the, the music on this show is like, really good <laughs> and you had something to do with it didn't you i scored the first Did five you? shows because yeah. they were looking for somebody who had some notoriety <laughs> to I get involved in the show i thought it was a funny story this just that just happened uh but, but anyway. i love scoring movies television shows i oh. might have done a lot of that work on the side too and then again it's an educational process uh multifaceted and anything that can give you a different perspective and something that you can learn from it's, that's a uh, great I'm, outlook for life i'm standing by you bet on a personal note We have a great friend in common, uh, Mr. Richard Zimmer, otherwise known as Paco. Paco Paco says hello, and he sends you his very best wishes. And uh, as I heard it, you and Paco's first meeting was in New York City in 1968 (laughs) at a gig with Vanilla Fudge and the Ultimate Spinach at the Sheep Meadows. At the Schaefer Beer Festival, that's correct. (laughs) Uh, Something about... So yeah, I don't have the story right, and I'm hoping you can flesh it out. But there's something about a recalcitrant musicians uh, union representative and uh, yes. steak dinners, uh, well, and yeah. other things. I got to be careful yeah. here because <laughs> I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> but uh, yes, I was in the musicians union in Boston, but I was not in the musicians union in New York. And uh, the uh, Vanilla Fudge. Their management was uh, very New York, Long Island. And when I finished the performance, uh, there I could see that I was, uh, th- there were going to be retribution. Uh, bones were probably going to be uh, uh, rearranged. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and the, the, the lead guitar player for the Vanilla Fudge, Vinny. Hey, Vinny. <laughs> Vinny. <laughs> Vinny. Yeah. Uh, who, who, who who put his hand up to the, the gentlemen that were approaching me. He says, hey, this guy is a good guy. He's a friend of mine. Back off. And they listened to him. Hmm. And I can't tell you what the next expression was, but it, Pac, it's, it's, it's brought Paco and I together yeah. for the past million years. And this was in 1968. I understand it's your personal greeting whenever you see each other. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and Paco went on to become probably one of the greatest road managers in the history of music. Led Zeppelin. Oh, and off the chart. Un- unbelievable. He's out with Kiss. Uh, I won't hold that against him. But, <laughs> and and a, an incredibly innovative promoter as well. Um, oh, he really you uh, bet. was a game changer in, in the And has a wonderful project doing this, this uh, interactive uh, project with Major League Baseball. That's right. Really cool idea. 
Again, looking at something from a different point of view, how do you get people, fans, to, part, to be able to participate even more in an, in an endeavor that they really enjoy and feel very strongly about? We did a Blue Sky meeting on that project. Yeah, I know. And he it told was me. tons of fun. It was really fun. And, and he took a lot of it to heart. I mean, yeah, was, he did. You know. It was, it was good to work with him again. And then you brought, see what you did is, you brought people who were not necessarily specifically focused on baseball, no. but who could think and look at a problem and break it down. And again, looking at, you know, sort of the John Boyd thing. And you brought that to this. And that was the one thing that impressed Paco the most. Mm. He said many of these people knew nothing, or not knew nothing, mm. but really weren't involved in baseball. But their expertise in problem solving was... Um, infinitely uh, helpful to what he wanted to do. Well, I'm glad to hear it. He's a, oh, he's a very absolutely. Guy. One of the best. That's awesome. The small world that it might be. This has been a lot of fun, Jeff, and we will put links to your lecture at IHMC in the show notes as well as other pointers for information about you You're and, a link, and a link you to your bio and your great titles. So thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we've gone a long way from Skip's place <laughs> in Providence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To uh, coming back together again, again, the same right. thing that you did is you, you, you looked at uh, the world from a different point of view and became a an, an expert and a a, a a guru of guidance in problem solving. So we both, in essence, took somewhat the same path, a long and winding road. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, and uh, it's great to be together. And thank you for doing the show. Pleasure's all mine. STEM talk. 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 Well, that was a lot of fun. So as I mentioned in the introduction, I'm a huge fan of classic rock. So it was so cool to talk with someone who has had such an influence on that genre of music. And then he actually transitioned into the science and tech realm. It was especially fun, Ken, to talk about your mutual acquaintances from the past. Hi, Paco. <laughs> yes, indeed. This interview was especially fun for me. And uh, it stimulated lots of great old memories. And uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Jeff taking the time to do it, and I was happy to join you. Absolutely. If you enjoyed this interview as much as we did, I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes, stemtalk.us. This is Don Cornegas signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.